uh, but, uh, but the services are open to everybody. So if you can be here and, and you, uh, uh, that works for you in, in that regard, of course, we encourage that. It's, the church is to assemble together as much as possible. Understanding, of course, we, we face some things today that we have not normally faced as we fi figure that out. Uh, but if you can be here, you certainly are welcome to be here. There's no, no uh, last name thing like we we're doing initially. Uh, Wednesday evening prayer services have resumed here in this room in the auditorium at 7 o'clock on Sunday. I'm sorry, Wednesday, so you're, you can be here for that. If you can't be here, there is a Zoom link that's sent out each Wednesday night as well. And then, uh, of course, there's no Sunday evening services for the rest of July and August, and that's what we've always done traditionally as well. So that's what we kind of have going on right now. The Sorrento Bible Study will be Wednesday. That's also available here or Zoom meeting. Pastor sends that link out as well. So that's generally what is going on at this time. Uh, I just want to make one more comment to you before Pastor returns. I uh, just looked at these. I didn't open it this morning, but just when you go to open these, we've never used these before, these little uh, communion cups, individual servings. If you didn't get one, they're at the back there when you come in. Uh, you know, take, take a moment to go back sometime during the service and grab one for yourself or your family as needed. Uh, but, uh, but these little cups, just note, note the fact that there's two little pull tabs on it. Uh, so when we do the, the bread, there'll be one tab to pull off, and then that'll keep the, uh, the, 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 the juice effectively uh, sealed up. Uh, so just keep that in mind when you open it. There's actually two tabs to open, so if you just rip the all off, uh, you're going to have uh, juice and everything else all at once. So just, just keep that in mind when we get to that point in service. I'll ask Pastor to come back up now. Well, Lord, Lord willing, we will um, begin next week to go through First Peter. Uh, but this morning, since we are having baptism and communion, I thought it would be appropriate uh, to have a particular message for this morning uh, separate from that. So if you'll turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, and um, again, this is going to be an abbreviated sermon, um, but I want to go through this passage briefly this morning. Colossians 2, verses 8 through 15. And again, I am reading from the New American Standard. Colossians 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy <clears throat> and empty deception. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him, you have been made complete. He is the head over all rule and authority. And in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross." When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Again, let's ask the Lord to bless our time in the word. Father, we again thank you for your word, the written word of God. <clears throat> we sing about the fact that it is a firm foundation. And your word is a firm foundation. It is the only firm foundation in this world. It is unchanging, unchangeable, unmoving. We thank you, Lord, that your truth is true from eternity past to eternity future. There is no change in the truth because there is no change in you, because you are the immutable God and you are the perfect God. There is no darkness in you. There is no unrighteousness in you. There is no change in you. And we acknowledge that you are all powerful and all glorious, and you have revealed yourself to us through the written word of God, revealed, yes, through holy men of God who were moved by the Holy Spirit, written down by men, but every word inspired, God-breathed, the Word of God. We thank you, and we know that it is powerful, that it is authoritative. 
And Lord, whether people reject it or receive it, it does not change its authority. It does not change its truth. It does not change its power. And we pray truly that you would enable each one of us, by your grace, to receive it meekly, to receive it humbly, to receive it truly, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the very word of God. Lord, you have said that you will look to this one, the one who trembles at your word. And I pray that we would fear the Lord, that is, fear your word. We pray that you would accomplish your purpose in us. And we pray this morning that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see the truth, Lord, that we might walk in it by your grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. True religion is knowing Christ. The only question that you have to answer ultimately is, do you know Christ? This really is the determining issue for your eternal well-being. To not know Christ is to be under the wrath of God and to experience the wrath of God ultimately for all eternity. To know Christ is to have eternal life and to be free from the wrath of God. The question is not, are you a member of the church or a church? The question is not, have you performed a particular ritual or ceremony like baptism? The question is not, have you signed on to the correct creed? The question is not, have you followed a particular moral code? Now I want to just say, all of those things may be of importance. It is important to belong to a church. It's important to be baptized. It's important to believe the right creed. And it's important to live a life that is upstanding. But none of those things save you. And I will tell you, there will be many a moralist in hell. There will be many a baptized church member in hell. Those things do not save you. That is not true religion. People love those things and embrace those things because it doesn't require the one thing that is necessary, which is a changed heart through faith in Christ. That's not, the question is not whether you're a church member or whether you've been baptized. The question is this, do you have Christ? Do you know Christ? Are you in Christ? Or, as Paul says so often, is Christ in you? That is true religion. The theme of the book of Colossians is the preeminence of Christ. The whole book, Paul is speaking about Christ as being preeminent above everything. And in fact, he emphasizes this well throughout, but I want you to look just briefly at verses chapter 1, verse 27 through 29. This defines his whole ministry. <clears throat> he says, To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. That is the only hope. Christ in you is his word in you. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. Christ in you is the Spirit in you. Christ, when he left, sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in those who believe on him. This is salvation. Christ in you by faith. He says in verse 28, we proclaim him, Christ, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete and there's that little phrase, in Christ. There's only way, one way that you will ever be presented 
complete before God. And that's in Christ. And then he says in verse 29, For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power which works mightily within me. Paul's whole purpose was this. It wasn't to create programs for people. It wasn't to make everyone feel good or to... It was ultimately this, to bring every man perfect, complete in Christ. To preach Christ. To warn in accordance with the truth of Christ. To teach the truth of Christ. And so when we come down here to chapter 2, verse 8, Paul speaks about all that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, all that we have in Christ. And I have a very short period of time this morning, but I want to give you five points as I just briefly walk through this text. And I will give you the list and walk through them individually again briefly. <clears throat> First of all, in verses 8 through 10, we find that we are complete in Christ. Secondly, we are alive in Christ in verses 11 and 12. Third, thirdly, we are forgiven in Christ in verse 13. In verse 14, we are free in Christ. And in verse 15, we are victorious in Christ. Now let me first of all begin in verses 8 through 10, and this is kind of a summary in a sense. We are complete in Christ. Verse 8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in Him you have been made complete and he is the head over all rule and authority. First of all, Paul warns in verse 8 about the fact that there are going to be people who are going to try to persuade you, he says earlier, with enticing words. They're going to persuade you or try to persuade you to bring on other things. Yeah, you can have Christ, but there's other things. You need more than Christ. And of course, with the Judaizers, it was you need circumcision and you need to follow the law. And then there were the mystics that he talks about later on, that you have to follow these days and do these certain, you know, seek these mystical experiences and Gnosticism and so forth. And Paul says, listen, you are perfect in Christ. Beware of anyone that takes away from the work of Christ or adds to the work of Christ because all you have is Christ. And I want to point out that the temptation throughout church history has always been to forsake Christ. And by the way, to forsake Christ is to forsake the Word of God because the Word of God is the Word about Christ. How do you know Christ other than through His Word? And just like the Israelites of the Old Testament were constantly falling into idolatry, where did they pick up that idolatry? They picked up that idolatry from the nations around them, from the world around them. And they were constantly being tempted by idolatry and drawn away after the gods of this world. And just so, the church has always been tempted and still is tempted and is continually being led away by the philosophies of this world, the systems of thought, the systems of religion. Oftentimes, Paul warns in another book about science falsely so-called, often it's in the name of science, often it's in the name of other truth, truth that the world has discovered that's not there in the Bible. Listen, beware of such. Because Christ is everything. He says in verse 9, he says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. In other words, Christ is all we need because Christ is God. In fact, in the first chapter of the book, this is kind of what he emphasizes. Christ is not only our salvation, Christ is the creator. He is the creator of everything in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible. Thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers, they're all made by him. They have all been made by him, and they're all kept by him. Everything has its being in Christ. 
He maintains everything. He upholds everything. Everything was created for him and by him. And not only that, he is also the creator, not only of the physical world and of things unseen, he's also the creator of the new person. He is the head of the body, the church, the firstborn from the dead. He is perfect as the Son of God and the Son of Man, the perfect mediator between men, between God and men, of which there is only one. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is perfect perfect and therefore he is all that we need we are complete in him he says in verse 10 and in him that is in christ and again i just have to remember remind you how often paul uses this little phrase in him or in christ in him you have been made complete not you will be made complete you have been made complete the truth is if you are in christ if you have christ if you have trusted in Christ, if you have repented of your sin and you have Christ, you have been made complete. Now, it doesn't mean that you're perfect today. We know scripturally that you're not without sin. But you have been made complete. You now have, in Christ, a perfect standing with God. And there is nothing else for you to seek than Christ. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. You have everything. You are complete. You have what you need in Christ for everything that you will ever face in this world or the next. You have been made complete in Christ. You have a perfect standing with God in Him. So don't forsake Him. Don't let others mix Christ with the philosophies of this age and of this world. That's always how the church has been corrupted. Well, not only are we complete in Christ, and the logic really of this passage that we're going through actually kind of is an extension of that truth. Or maybe we could say an explanation of that truth. What does it mean that we have been complete, made complete in Christ? Well, he answers that more or less in the following verses. And so the second point we have in verses 11 and 12 is that we are alive in Christ. We are complete in Christ. We are alive in Christ. Verses 11 and 12, he says, And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. He mentions two ordinances, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. He mentions circumcision. Circumcision was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Every Jew, every male Jew, age eight days was circumcised, as a sign of the covenant of Abraham that God had given to Abraham back in Genesis 12 and 15 and 17. In the New Testament, every follower of Christ is baptized. What Paul here is doing, he's not speaking about physical circumcision or physical baptism. He's talking about what those things were meant to represent and what they were meant to picture. And oftentimes in the Old Testament, the prophet, including Moses himself in the book of Deuteronomy, called them to a circumcised heart. It wasn't good enough to have a physical circumcision. That didn't get you into the kingdom. That didn't mean that you were connected ultimately for eternity with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Your heart had to be circumcised. And that cutting away of that flesh was a picture of the need to repent and have a new heart and put off the body of sin. Put off sin. Repent of sin. Not merely have a piece of flesh cut off of your body. And Paul is saying here that in Christ you have a circumcised heart. A new heart. A changed heart. One that actually loves God. 
so it is with baptism. He says, buried with, in him, with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith. Again, he's not speaking there about water baptism. He's not speaking there about, it's not like you're born again when you enter the waters of baptism. That simply is a picture of what takes place in a person's heart when they are born again. You are buried with Christ in his death. You are raised together with Christ in his life. Romans chapter 6, where we find he's talking about union with Christ. We can say with Paul, if you're in Christ, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's the new birth. The only way that you can be made alive spiritually, we're all dead in sins and trespasses, as he's going to say here in a minute, the only way that you can have life, that is to know God and to be reconciled to God and to have a heart that actually loves God, is Christ must, God must make you alive in Christ, through faith in Christ, through faith in His Word, to turn away from your sin and to acknowledge that you cannot save yourself or do anything for yourself, to turn away from your pride and your arrogance and your self-righteousness and to humble yourself before God and in the name of Christ call out and ask Him to forgive you for your sins and to give you a new heart and to save you and to change you. He makes us alive. That old King James word, He quickens us. He makes us alive in Christ. This is what we have in Christ. And there's no other way to be made alive. There is no other way to have a changed heart. There is no other way to serve God or to know God or to love God than through faith in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to the Father. The only one that knows the Father is the one to whom the Son reveals Him. We are alive eternally in Christ. We have eternal life in Christ. So we are complete in Christ. We are alive in Christ. In verse 13, we find that we are forgiven in Christ. And this is the means by which we are made alive. So if I can put it this way, a little bit of the logic of of his argument here, we are complete in Christ. We are complete in Christ because we're made alive in Christ. We have eternal life in Christ. We have a relationship with God. We know God. And how did he accomplish that? Because we're forgiven in Christ. He says, again, verse uh, 13, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him having forgiven us all our transgressions. Now, I want you to notice the first, per, first part of this verse really explains what I just explained about verses 11 and 12. When he says, when you were dead in your transgressions, that's referring to verse 12. When he says, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, that's reversing back to verse 11, kind of a chiastic form. And what he's saying basically is, you were in need of, you were in need of the new birth, you were in need of the circumcision made without hands. He made you alive together with Christ. And here's how he did it. This is the end of the verse. Having forgiven us all transgressions. And we go back to this this reality that the only problem that man has, the only ultimate problem that man has is the problem of righteousness. He has not. That's why he dies. And by the way, that's the reason we have all the problems we have in this world. Whether it's racial strife, whether it's poverty, whether it's war, whatever it is. The bottom line, listen, it's not social, it's not social sin. It's personal sin. It's your sin. That's why every one of us dies. 
because we're sinners. We have this great problem of sin. We cannot know God unless our sin is dealt with. And we have nothing that we can do. Can anyone bring something clean from something that's unclean? Job asked that question many centuries ago. And the answer is no. When you're unclean, you're a sinner, there is absolutely nothing that you can do that is counted clean by God. Everything you touch becomes unclean. Everything you do is unclean because you are in rebellion against the true and the living God. And what we desperately need, every one of us, is forgiveness. The forgiveness of our sins. Now, this is justification. Justification by faith is the means by which we are made alive, by the means by which we are born again. I emphasize constantly the need to keep those two together, the new birth and justification. There is no one who is born again without being justified, without being forgiven of their sins through faith in Christ. There is no one that is justified, that is forgiven of their sins, who is not also born again. And that's why we expect when someone is actually justified by faith, we expect that their life changes. Not that they become perfect, but that they have a new heart because the two always go together. My friend, if you're forgiven, you have a new heart. Listen, I can say to you today that if you don't love God and you don't love His Word or submit to His Word, you are not justified. And you say, well, what must I do to be justified? You can't do justification. You must believe on Christ alone. And through that, you are made alive. You are united in simple faith with Christ in his death and resurrection, and you are made alive. And listen, this is the beauty of being in Christ. You are forgiven for everything, past, present, and future. All of your sins are atoned for in Christ. This is the greatest joy of any true believer. This is the beauty of being in Christ. We observe then the logic, the fourth point. We are not only complete in Christ, we are not only alive in Christ, we are not only forgiven in Christ, we are free in Christ. Look at verse 14. This explains how he forgave our sins. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. See, how did he forgive us? How did he justify us? How could God, a just God, just overlook sin and just say, well, you're forgiven? How can God do that and still be just? Paul asked that question in Romans 3. And the answer is the cross. But I want you to observe here that what is hanging over every one of us outside of Christ is the law. You know, people can convince themselves through positive thinking and so forth that they're good people and they've done enough good things. But the truth is, when they stand before a righteous judge at the great white throne they will find themselves utterly condemned by the law of God. The law of God is relentless, and it is opposed, it is utterly opposed, and uses the word hostile here, hostile to every sinner. Every sinner will be judged by the law, and there's no grace in the law. When you're convicted of a crime and you stand before the judge and you say to the judge, well, judge, I'm sorry. Well, that's great, but that doesn't really solve anything. You committed murder, you're going to the death sentence. You say, well, well, judge, you don't understand. I'm really a good person at heart. Well, judge, I won't do it again, judge. There's none of that in the law. 
there is punishment. But in Christ, we are free. That law was literally nailed to the cross. So that when Christ died on the cross and shed his blood, gave his life, he was perfect. But not only was he perfect as a man, he was the Son of God, very God. And there, he completely satisfied all of the just demands of the law on my behalf so that I can never ever be condemned by the law. Christ freed me from the condemnation of the law. And as Jesus said, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed not merely a servant, a son. He freed us from condemnation of the law, but I want to also point out he freed us from the law generally. As uh, Paul often says in the New Testament, we are no longer under the law, but under grace. That has often been misused <clears throat> to suggest that I can live however I want. That's not at all what Paul's saying. In fact, he's saying just the opposite. <clears throat> the proof that you're under grace is that you actually follow Christ and you obey Christ. And someone who says, well, I'm not under the law anymore and therefore I can do whatever I want, proves that they're still under the law, proves that they're still under condemnation. Listen, if you have a new heart and you're not under the law, you now have Christ in you. You have the Holy Spirit and you do walk. You want to walk in the truth. <clears throat> but we are free in Christ. And lastly, briefly in verse 15, we are victorious in Christ. Verse 15, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. I want to point out the fact that in Christ, when we have come to Christ and we've died to ourselves, we've been made alive in Christ, we no longer live for ourselves, we are no longer our own, we have been bought with a price, we now please Christ, we now please God. We are now servants of righteousness. We are now servants of God. We are no longer under the dominion of Satan. And I realize we live in a world that laughs at the thought of Satan oftentimes, but Satan is extremely active, and where he's active is in controlling men. The means by which Satan controls people is through their lusts. And um, people who are led by their lusts are really being led by Satan. In fact, Paul writes in Ephesians 2, he says, and you, you know this passage, but I want you to see the connection. He says, And you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Listen, Satan leads people by their lusts. When you walk according to your lusts, you are led about by the nose by Satan, whether you realize it or not. You are following him. Indeed, you are under his authority. He says in verse 3, Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Let me point out too, just as a side, as a Christian, uh, the great danger of following our lusts as a believer is we do open ourselves up to the attack of Satan. And uh, the only safe way to live is to submit to Christ, to die to self. In Colossians 1.13, Paul said, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. We are no longer under the dominion of Satan. We are no longer under uh, his... Not that, not that we're not have, have no threat from Satan. He still can tempt us. He still is our great adversary. But we are no longer under the dominion of Satan. 
And in Christ, we have nothing to fear from Satan because we are complete in Christ. We are forgiven in Christ. We are free in Christ. And so I ask you this morning, are you complete in Christ? Are you alive in Christ? Do you have a new heart? Have you been changed by God through faith in Christ? Are you forgiven in Christ? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt today, that your sins are truly forgiven in Christ. You have a clear conscience before God because of faith in Christ. Are you free in Christ? Are you free from condemnation and from the law? Are you victorious in Christ? Listen, you can know that. You can know that today. And if you don't know that, then it's probably likely that you're not alive in Christ. You can know that you are alive in Christ and you you are complete in Christ. And I would say to you to call upon him and ask him, ask God for Christ's sake to forgive you for your sin, to give you a new heart, to make you alive, and to change you, and to lead you, and to teach you. He always hears the humble. Listen, he never turns away any human being, no matter how old or how young, no matter what you have done or haven't done. He never turns away the humble that comes to him in the name of Christ. And this morning as we again celebrate both baptism and the Lord's Supper, we are reminded of the power of God to change the human heart. And we are thankful today that, again, for the work that has been done in uh, Julia and Karis and uh, Representative, I know so many, um, again, of you have already been baptized and have faith in Christ. And as you listen to these baptisms and you hear them, you, I'm sure, think of your own baptism and the work that God did in your own heart. And it's a great blessing and encouragement to see how uh, people works in the lives of his children. Well, we want to, uh, again, just conclude by encouraging you as believers in Christ with your completeness in Christ. He is all that we need. Indeed, he's all that we have, and we are thankful for all that God has given to us in him. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your work, which is immeasurable. We confess we cannot even grasp the greatness of your grace and your mercy and your goodness toward us. In sending your son to die in our place, in drawing us unto yourself by the Holy Spirit, teaching us, giving us new life, saving us, forgiving us, giving us eternal hope beyond the grave, overcoming death on our behalf through the death and the resurrection of our Savior. We thank you and praise you that we have Christ and that we are complete in Christ. And Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to us and may you especially bless us now as we Uh, As we observe these baptisms and as we celebrate the Lord's table, we pray that you would be glorified and you would be honored and that Christ would be exalted. Lord, as we think upon these truths, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue our service now, Pastor prepares and the young ladies prepare for this uh, baptism service. So I'm going to ask you to to, uh, rejoin me in hymns. And the first hymn that we're going to sing, we're going to sing two at this time. Uh, The first one is hymn number 403. So I'm going to ask you to turn to that hymn number 403. Uh, You can remain seated for this, not what my hands have done. So uh, 403.
It's one of those hymns you sing and you can sometimes get lost almost in the words and forget your, I tell you, I can forget sometimes I'm standing up here. Uh, you really get lost in the words of, of that particular hymn and it's such a great uh, hymn to follow the message we heard that really does point to Christ and that, that hymn really just says that over and over again. So uh, greatly blessed by that. Well, we'll have one more hymn before, uh, before we start the baptism. It's hymn number 421, the first tune. Rock of Ages, a hymn that I'm sure we all well know. Hymn number 421, the first tune, Rock of Ages. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please, for us go ahead and stretch our legs for a moment. Please be seated. Well, 
baptism is our testimony to, first of all, the church, but to the world that we are followers of Christ. It's a testimony that we have believed on Christ, we have trusted Christ for the salvation of our soul, that we have trusted him for the forgiveness of our sins, and that we are born again by the grace of God. Baptism does not accomplish that, and we try to emphasize that. Baptism does not accomplish that. Baptism does not guarantee that. It is simply a picture and a statement and a testimony. We do it because we have been commanded to baptize And indeed, the first thing that a believer uh, does is they get baptized to show the world that they have believed on Christ. The word baptism actually means immerse. And uh, that's why we immerse when we baptize. It is a picture, among other things, it is a picture of the washing away of our sins that we have been cleansed of our sins by faith in Christ. We've been washed by the blood of Christ. It's also a picture of our immersion into Christ by the Holy Spirit. And that is that when we're born again, the Holy Spirit places us in Christ. That is, we are part of the body of Christ. And we have the Holy Spirit. And so this is a picture of our immersion into Christ, that we are in Christ. So having said that, uh, every baptism is special. And uh, it's uh, always a a glorious thing to hear the testimonies of of all the saints as they come to Christ. I always enjoy reading them as they come to me. But um, I have the special privilege of baptizing my second daughter this morning. Uh, I baptized Catherine some years ago, and uh, now I have another daughter that I didn't have back then, and that came into my life rather unexpectedly and suddenly, Julia, and so it's a great blessing to be able to baptize her today. So, Hi, I'm Julia. Um, I normally don't like reading off paper, but I don't trust myself to go rogue, so I'm going to try to stick to this. Um, So first of all, I want to thank all of you for showing the most sincere hospitality and kindness as you welcomed my mom and I into your church family and made the transition into this new phase of our lives so much easier. I've been wanting to get baptized for a while, and I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to declare the glorious work of the Lord in my life in front of you all. So... The Lord was really merciful to allow me to grow up in a loving Christian home and attended church that faithfully taught the word and was filled with great examples of true believers and servants of Christ. I can never remember a time where I doubted God's existence or my need of a savior and gave my life to Christ very early on. My childhood was seemingly perfect. I had a part, I was part of a whole and happy family. Uh, We went on awesome vacations together, I excelled in school and sports, had great friends, and even had the perfect family dog, Charlie. The Lord knew, um, however, that these worldly pleasures weren't in and of themselves evil, but that my sinful nature was inclined to trust in them and in myself, and that they were preventing me from having a deep relationship with him. So in 2014, the Lord slowly began to test my faith by taking these comforts away from me, starting with the death of our beloved dog, Charlie. Then, on a much greater level, my dad began his fight with stage 4 cancer, soon after which I tore my ACL playing soccer and was for nine months taken out of the sport that I'd always spent almost every day playing since I was four. Then finally, on July 27, 2016, the Lord took my amazing dad to be home with him. I knew that I had to make the decision to either pity myself and doubt the Lord's goodness or cling to Christ and put into practice what I had been claiming to believe all of my life. Thankfully, the Lord made the choice very clear because after everything that had happened, it was blatantly obvious that he was the only stable, unfailing, and unchangeable aspect of my life. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19 testifies to the peace that comes from a life anchored in Christ. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no f- food. <laughs> the flock be cut off from the fold, and there should be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. 
God was teaching me not to put confidence in the flesh. Watching my dad on his deathbed, I was so clearly I so clearly saw firsthand and understood the significance of the song I'd sung so many times in church. All I had was Christ. Shout out to Dean for preaching on that. Um, in an instant, the comforts of this world could be taken away, and then what would I have left? And if Christ died to ransom my life from sin, how could I go on living a life that minimizes the seriousness of the very thing that held him on the cross? I really and truly understood that my relationship with him is the most precious thing that I have and would ever have, and that my sole purpose for living this life was not to obtain earthly treasure, comfort, and glory for myself, but to be obedient to the word of God and seek his will for his glory. Watching both of my parents, example of devotion to God and his word amidst great trial, I gained an eternal perspective which exposed the way I had been wasting my life and effectiveness by only pursuing the Lord half-heartedly. I realized that what I did for the Lord or what the Lord did through me was the only thing that would ever matter one day when I would lay on my deathbed, deathbed and join my dad in glory. I'd like to say that I immediately started studying the scriptures every single day and praying consistently, but that was not the case. Over the next couple years, the Lord used my various weaknesses and mistakes I had made while battling the, tempta- the deceptive lure of the world to show me the depravity of my heart and its unrighteous tendency towards the lust of the flesh. As the God of all comfort, he was also healing my heart from the pain and loss and gave me specific opportunities to use my, the strength he had given me to comfort others, as commanded in 2 Corinthians 1.4. It wasn't until I went to college at Liberty University that I truly began to grow exponentially in my love for the Lord, his word, and others. Previously, my walk with the Lord had resembled that of King Amaziah in 2 Chronicles 25-2, who, as the king of Jerusalem for 29 years, quote, did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. Now, by the steadfast grace of the Lord, I have come to realize that my greatest gain lies beyond this life. And because of this, I commit in front of you all, not just to do what is right, but to wholeheartedly pursue the Lord who has so faithfully pursued me. That's good. Uh, Julia, because you profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hi, my name is Kara Slower. I grew up in a Christian home and I've always been taught well by my parents and by this church and its teachers. Because of this background, I thought that I would probably become a Christian someday because it was expected of me, but I wanted to wait till I was older. I had a lot of biblical knowledge, but it meant nothing because I wasn't applying it to my life. When I did get older, I still wanted to wait, even though I was being convicted by the preaching of God's word and knew I was a sinner. Several times, because I was afraid of dying or of Christ's return, I asked God to forgive me, but not in faith or humility. I was scared to sleep at night because I knew I was not ready to die or for Christ's return. At the beginning of the year, I was greatly convicted about the life I had been leading, trying to be good when I could not be apart from God, and living for this world's fading pleasures. It was around then that I truly repented of my sin, asked God to forgive me, and gave my life to him. It was only through Christ dying on the cross that I have been saved, and I am so thankful and amazed that he would die so that I could live. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. I am so thankful that God opened my eyes to see my sinful state, and that without him I am nothing. I love Psalm 16.2, which says, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. Now that my life is the Lord's, I have no reason to fear in uncertain times because God is in control. I'm getting baptized today because it is commanded in Bible to do so. Two of my favorite verses are 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And I also like Psalm 16, 5, which says, The Lord is my portion and my cup. You hold my lot. 
And I'm thankful to be able to say that truly and to know God holds my law and my life so that because I'm in him, I have nothing to fear. Karis, because you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the work that you have done in Karis and in Julia. Lord, we know that uh, the work that you do is often uh, takes time, and Lord, is not oftentimes the work of a moment. But Lord, even uh, how you use the words of parents and family and friends and pastors and churches, people in their lives, Lord, the word of God, how you use all these things, Lord, to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have brought Karis and Julia to the knowledge of the truth that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the way in which you have granted them repentance and faith in the true and the living God in the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you for the forgiveness of their sins. Lord, we want to pray today that you would strengthen both of them. Lord, as they uh, continue in their lives, however long you give them upon this earth, we pray that they would grow in their knowledge of Christ, that they would grow in the grace of Christ, that you would strengthen them, Lord, in the midst of a world, again, that will oppose them, in the midst, perhaps, of many trials and troubles, perhaps, and struggles, but also many blessings, too. Lord, in the midst of all these things, may they trust you, may they seek you, may they walk with you. May you indeed present them perfect in Christ Jesus in that day. We thank you that through Christ you present us unblameable and unreprovable, perfect before you. And we thank you for the way in which you have accomplished this, Lord, in their lives. We ask, Lord, that you would be glorified in them, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. What a blessing, amen? amen. It's uh, beautiful to see uh, the, uh, well, really what was uh, preached by Pastor uh, from Colossians, the preeminence of Christ uh, in the gospel, in, in uh, our salvation, and then to hear that actually spoken out by two young ladies uh, in their testimony. It's a wonderful thing to be able to see that all come together, to know that's happening in the world even today. All the unknowns of the world today are certainly still present with us, and they always will be until Christ returns. Uh, but amongst those unknowns is always a known that's available, and that known is Christ. Uh, he can know us and we can know him in the gospel and in the submission to him uh, to that gospel message. Well, we'll continue now as we start to uh, think even about communion uh, and the opportunity of participating in the Lord's uh, table as a group of people, as a group of believers uh, who have placed their faith and confidence in him. And in doing so, we're going to sing two more hymns this morning. The first one's going to be hymn number 596, Jesus Lives and So Shall I. So you can remain seated for hymn number 596, Jesus Lives and So Shall I. I.
before pastor comes, and that is hymn number 580, so just a few pages back, hymn number 580. I'm going to stand once again uh, for this hymn, hymn number 580, It Is Well With My Soul. Amen. Please be seated. Well, let me uh, just <clears throat> point out the logical connection between baptism and communion. As I mentioned, when you're baptized, you're baptized into Christ, you're immersed into Christ. We baptize once because it's a statement of the fact that you only enter into communion with Christ in that regard once. You are justified once, you are born again once, you are saved once and for all. And no matter how many troubles you may face in your life, and you will have your 
troubles and trials and difficulties and you will sin and repent and sin and repent. You'll wax and wane in your sanctification. But one thing is true. You are never out of Christ. You're in Christ. So we only baptize once. But we celebrate the Lord's table regularly because it's a statement of the fact that we have communion with Christ and with the body of Christ. And that's why we do it together. It's not merely a statement of the fact that we have communion with Christ. It's that in Christ we have communion with each other. The great unity of the church is not a political unity. It's not that we belong to the same organization. It's that we belong to Christ and that we have the Holy Spirit and that we believe in the same Lord Jesus Christ. And that unity we have, and again, communion is is an expression of how that came to be or why that is. It's because of the fact that we have all partaken of Christ. We have, as it were, eaten his flesh and drunk his blood in the sense that we have exercised faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. That is our communion. So this morning we want to celebrate the Lord's table. We want to remember the Lord's table together. Let me begin by reading 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 34. First Corinthians 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly." For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. Paul makes it clear here that what we do is, first of all, a remembrance. He says we remember his death until he comes. And the idea here is not that there's some kind of uh, magical grace that's conveyed to someone for taking part of the communion. There's no grace conveyed. You're not saved through it. You're not kept through it. You're not changed by it. It's a remembrance. It's a remembrance of the fact that Christ gave his life for my sin. And that's the reason that I have life. In the same way that the Jews once a year celebrated Passover, it wasn't a mystical, magical, sacramental event. It was simply a way that God had provided for them to remember year in and year out and year in and year out that God had delivered them out of Egypt. It was so they would remember. And that's why we celebrate the Lord's table. It is to remember But I also like to emphasize the fact that we ought to take it seriously. Even though it is a memorial, we might say just a memorial, as opposed to a sacrament, it is also very serious. He actually says in this passage that some people were sick and dying, and some people actually had died because they had taken the cup and the bread unworthily. In other words, they were walking, there was known sin in their life, and they weren't Uh, living as they ought to live, and therefore God took them away. I don't think it necessarily means they weren't saved, but God, there is a sin unto death. And, um, And these people were actually taken away because they took the bread and the cup unworthily. So what we do here is not taken lightly. And, um, 
I always emphasize, if you're here visiting with us, um, you're welcome to take the bread and the cup with us if, first of all, you're born again, you have put your faith in Christ, and uh, you know Christ as your Savior, but also that you're walking as best as you know before the Lord with a clear conscience. Again, that doesn't mean that you're perfect or you never sin. None of us are there. We'd never take communion. But the idea that there's not known uh, sin in your life, there's not something that you know that needs to be dealt with and that you're not dealing with. Um, And I also say if you've been baptized, because um, baptism and communion are related. And the idea is that you're baptized and then you have communion. In other words, you come into Christ and then you have communion with the church and with the body of Christ. And uh, if you were, came to Christ today and you didn't have opportunity to be baptized, take communion. But I have a feeling there are people that sit in the pews week after week, month after month, and they've never been baptized, but they te- keep taking communion. And I would say that's disobedience. It's easier to take communion than be baptized. You need to be baptized because that's the first commandment to every believer to be baptized. And then you partake of communion. So... Having said that, let me, uh, before we actually partake of the elements, let me take a few minutes, as I always do, and just give opportunity for you to quietly bow your heads. And if there's something that you need to, be, you need to make right with the Lord, something you need to confess, turn over to Him to do that, and just to prepare your own heart and your own mind to receive uh, the communion. So let's just have a moment of silent, private prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work that was accomplished by Christ on the cross. We thank you for the way in which you have worked in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, applying that work and bringing us to salvation, convicting us of our sin, convicting us of our condemnation, of our lostness, the judgment of God upon us. But Lord, not leaving us there, but actually giving us faith in Christ so that we have come to rest in the finished work of Christ. We have come to find Christ as our refuge, our rock, our help, our hope, our life. We thank you for the work that you have accomplished uh, for us and in us. But Lord, we acknowledge our weakness and we acknowledge our frailty and Lord, we acknowledge how easily we are drawn away by sin, how easily we are caught up in this world. And we ask, Lord, truly that you would purify us and cleanse us and prepare our hearts, Lord, even today as we partake of the bread and the cup. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we normally uh, have to hand out the elements, and uh, we don't have to do that today, but we are still going to sing a hymn before each one, and I will pray before each one. But let us, uh, let us begin by singing. If you'll turn over to uh, hymn number 178, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, as we prepare to partake of the bread. 178.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Christ gave his life for us. We thank you, Lord, that that sacred head was wounded for our justification. That he voluntarily, humbly, uh, gave his life in obedience to your command, in obedience to your will. He gave his life upon the cross. He went as a sheep without complaint, without a word. He gave his life not because he had done anything wrong or not because he had sinned in any way, shape, or form. Indeed, there was no guile in his mouth. He had never sinned in word or thought or deed. He was perfect in every way, and yet he gave his life for us. We thank you that he did that, and we confess our unworthiness, and Lord, we would indeed remember today your grace in our lives through his work. And We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Well, let's turn to hymn number 188 as we prepare to take the cup there is a fountain 188 
Father, we thank you that it was through the blood of Christ that we have been ransomed, that we have been purchased by his blood, justified from our sin, declared righteous before God on the basis of the finished work of Christ on the cross. We thank you for the blood of Christ. Thank you that we, by your grace, have been washed clean, forgiven for all that we have ever done or ever will do, that our sins have been separated us from us as far as the east is from the west. They have been thrown into the depths of the sea, never to be remembered again through the blood of Christ. We thank you for the forgiveness we have in him, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do this, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Well, let's stand and sing the closing hymn, 731, And Can It Be?
Well, before I close in prayer, I just want to let you know that today we're going to dismiss by rows. So we'll start in the back and walk back, just so not everybody's going back at once. So uh, as we close in prayer, just the ushers will dismiss. Let's close. Father, we do thank you for the glory of Christ. And we thank you that you not only have justified us, that you've not only saved us from our sin, but Lord, you keep us, preserve us, and you will glorify us. We look forward to that day when we shall have perfect fellowship in a perfect place with no sin, no death, no sorrow, no pain. Lord, we thank you for these promises in your word. May we go forth from here in the joy of the Lord. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.